collaborations. Then step two, identifying the strengths and barriers to learning for the whole class, and then for specific individuals with disability and diverse learning needs, and identifying the universal strategies and then the instructional, environmental and curriculum adjustments. Then we look at the achievement standards and deconstruct it for the year level achievement standard, then identifying the target achievement standards and looking at what are the similarities and differences. And looking at those two examples, some are very, very similar. It's the type of text that you choose. Others have differences. Now, once we've done that and we plan using that information um, and then we implement it, we need to think about evaluating what we've done, that step four of the model. And it talks about evaluating those actions that we took. So what are the strengths of the approach that we took? What are the challenges or what could be done better next time? Talking to all those people involved and thinking about what are those strategies we have? What could we change? What can we keep on doing? One of the things that I'm really interested in this evaluation approach is sometimes when we think about the strengths and the barriers to learning, or strengths of how it could be improved. You know, sometimes we make those judgments based on what we think is happening. One of the pieces of work that I'm interested in is that gap in inclusive education between what is often planned and what actually happens in the classroom. Because have you ever looked at a lesson plan or a unit or a personalized learning plan and it's really good, but then that classroom teacher then might end up just talking at the kids and that gap. I find that interesting because that can be a barrier to learning because the, a teacher might perceive that they're doing all these inclusive practices, but in reality, they're doing something else. So just before we finish up, I'd like to show you a useful tool for, to help overcome that. If we go NCC evidence templates, notice they're all optional, but if um, the federal government's going to suggest that, that we use it, I often think it's a worthwhile thing to do because it's a defensible position. Why are you using it? Because the federal government suggests so. So if we come down to the bottom, you've got two student observation template, individual and multiple. So every student classroom has multiple students with disabilities. So this document just tells you about what it's used for, but then it's someone going into a classroom observing. So who's the per name of the person going to observe? What are they looking for? Here, grade year level class, date of observation, the names of the students with disability um, that are being supported by that strategy. So I like to use initials because if you use full names and a document gets out, then you've got a breach of confidentiality. What is that that you're looking at? It might be uh, visual mind mapping, visual, um, you know, scaffold on the board, those sort of things. And then the observer writing down what they've seen and then how it could be further improved. So um, it might be, yep, yeah, actually the teacher in their plan said they're gonna have a visual schedule, um, but there was no schedule on the whiteboard, support the teacher to put the visual schedule in because even though that strategy is in the planning and actually doesn't happen in practice, that might be a um, barrier to the learning process. So as we look, go back and look at the evaluation element of that case model. Following the first three steps is important, but that evaluation is really important to think about what went well and what didn't and how we can overcome that. I want you to thank you for joining us today, having a look at the 